Wow, what an amazing truth we just sang. Do you remember what those words said? Show us your glory. You know what happens when he shows us his glory? I heard Jennifer singing this over and over again. Jesus, you change everything. That's why Cedar Heights Baptist today is giving you this opportunity of worship because we honestly believe that Jesus changes everything. We truly believe that he is the answer. I want to express my gratitude to Brother Charlie, Brother Chad, and all of the church family for opening the door for us to be with you again. We have ministered in a lot of places, but this is one of our favorites. We love being here. And we want to thank you for keeping this door open for us to come and share the gospel with you. I was amazed at all of the technology that is going on in our worship of the King today. I remember years ago, probably 35, I came by a man who had broken down on the interstate in Pensacola, Florida. And I picked him up and was carrying him back to Mobile, Alabama. And here's what he says. He was an IBM a worker on computers. And he said, the day will come, sir, that if you don't have a computer, you won't be able to survive. Well, I kind of chuckled under my breath. And little does he know, he has no idea. I won't ever use a computer. Well, guess what? I've seen amazing things done with technology. Right now, while I am preaching the gospel to you, in the Philippines, though it is close to midnight there, there are people that are listening to this broadcast while the gospel is being preached. I remember when I used to communicate with my staff in the Philippines, it would be 40 days from the time I wrote my letter and mailed it to them until they could return a letter to me. And here I am today because of incredible technology, preaching to them, and they're listening live in the Philippines. What an amazing thing. I want to say to Cedar Heights Baptist Church, thank you for reaching out to us and through us to reach people. God laid it on our heart in these countries where we're ministering that there are people that were hungry. They don't have deep freezes. They don't have canned food. They don't have access to food to uh, put it in a place that it stays good for months like we do as in a deep freeze or can. And they have to go every day to get food. And so when this pandemic began, God touched our hearts to begin feeding people in several countries. And by His grace, we're feeding thousands now. Not just one meal, but giving them enough food to assist them in the days of head. You've been a part of that. You've had church members that received our newsletter and they began to send out monies to us and we've entrusted that. I want to say to you, Brother Chad challenged you about giving to our ministry. If you send money and you want it to be used for feeding the people, if you were to send it to us, you be sure and designate feeding the needy because we're required by law to use monies as they're designated and since we didn't have this much money in our budget in International Missions Association to send this food we have to have the funds that are designated so it can be done properly and in order. I'm amazed at what the Lord has done while we've been studying the word. I want to ask you to take your Bibles and look at a passage with us that is found in the book of John chapter 9. Now, we have been in the book of John, chapter 9, with you before. You probably forgot about that. This is the story of the blind young man who was born blind. Here is a man that never in his life had ever been able to see. You might recall that we talked to you a couple of three years ago about that which God used to bring healing to this man. The Bible said that Jesus actually spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes and he said, now go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. And the young man went and bathed his eyes in that water and the word of God said that he could see. Well, the portion of this scripture that I want to share with you today, I want to talk to you about genuine, true, biblical worship. I want us to look at three things today. And that is, what is the origin of biblical worship? And then secondly, how does this worship continue? And then lastly, how long does it last? 
How long is the endurance of true biblical worship? So in this ninth chapter of John, let me read to you verses 34. Well, let me read verse 35. They're standing here if you'd like to stand as Brother Chad challenged us. Verse 35 of the ninth chapter of the book of John. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believed, and he worshipped him. Thank you. You can be seated. We're talking about worship today, but to get us to these verses, let me give you a recap of what is going on. The fact is, the majority of the message is going to be dealing with something that is not about worship, but it is a beginning of worship, and it is necessary in this young man's life. Here is a man that had never seen before. I can't imagine his dilemma. There have been times in my life that I've tried to function without light. There have been times that I was trusting in the light and all of a sudden the light went dim and I stumbled around. I found myself even falling all the way to the ground or to the floor because of darkness because I was accustomed to the light. Can you imagine what this young man went through having never been able to see? And so the Bible said, here is a man who not one time in his life had never been able to look at his hands. He had never looked at the stars. He had never seen the moon. He had never looked at the face of his mother or his dad or the face of his friends. He had never seen a flower. He had never even seen grains of sand. He had never seen anything. Thank God that the Bible said Jesus is always interested in our dilemma. To this young man, his dilemma was not being able to see. And so the Bible said that Jesus stopped by and minister to him. Now I want you to look at the beginning of this. The word of God said, Jesus saw a man that was blind. And the disciples' immediate response, and we've talked to you about this before, here's what the church, the disciples said. Well, who sinned? Did this man sin? Or did his mother sin? Or did his daddy sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said, neither has this man sinned, nor his mother, nor his dad. Now, the Bible doesn't say that they were sinless. But what Jesus is saying is that this man's dilemma, his not being able to see, was not related to a sin that he had committed, or his mother, or his dad. Now, I want you to listen to this. The Bible said that Jesus used uh, plain, ordinary things, spittle, and dirt, and water, and healing came to him. Well, the word of God said the young man goes down to the pool of Siloam and he washes his eyes and now he can see. This is amazing to me. I can imagine what he must have felt. Uh, We have a granddaughter who has cerebral palsy and because she was born at 15 ounces and has scars from her chin to her toes 21 years ago, uh, she has struggled with cerebral palsy. She can walk and get around and lives a delightful life, but... She has some mental limitations, and I can imagine uh, what it would be like when we get to heaven one day, when Bonnie Claire is walking the streets of glory without any hindrances. I can imagine what this young man must have felt, having never been able to take a step because he was watching where his feet would go. But here is a young man, having never seen, uh, I suspect he might be running a little bit, going up the hill rejoicing. But I want you to notice this, not a single soul rejoiced with him. Are you listening to this? How would you respond if somebody was struggling? How would you respond if someone had been miraculously healed by God? What would be your response? The Bible indicates to us nobody rejoices. I'm amazed. Now I'm going to ask Brother Charlie and Brother Chad to investigate this. Here the disciples began to speak about this man's dilemma and say, well, he must have sinned, and there's no discussion of the disciples after this point. I'm assuming they are still around, but it may be that they became immediately silent because they felt Jesus had rebuked them because they thought they had the situation sized up, somebody must have sinned, and nothing else is said about the disciples in this situation. However, I want you to notice this. 
as a young man is coming back, walking up the hill, the question is asked, how did you get to where you could see? And he said, uh, well, I don't have a clue. All I know is a man that they called Jesus uh, touched my eyes with clay and told me to wash, and I did that, and now I can see. And the Word of God said they took this man and took him to those who were perceived to be intelligent religious people. Can I tell you this? You better be careful listening to intelligent religious people. Religion is not the answer. They took this young man to the Pharisees. They wanted them to evaluate this man. Now the question was asked. Is this the young man? Now, the Bible gives us an indication that there were friends and neighbors that were asked about this. Here's the question that we ask. Is this the young man that was born blind? Now, listen to the answer. Some said, uh, well, he looks like him. Can I ask you a question? Does a man's looks change because his eyes are open? How could they give an answer like this when they said, is this that young man? And the answer is, well, he looks like him. Have you ever been around people who were afraid to make commitments? Did you know that coming to Jesus in redemption, there is the necessity of commitment? Have you ever been around people that vacillate? They'll think one way today and another way tomorrow and another way the next day. The Bible said these people could not even say Yes, this is the young man whom we have watched all of his life, and he's blind. Their answer is, some said, well, he's like him. He's like him. I'm amazed as I travel around preaching the gospel and discussing the Bible with people that some people are fearful to say, thus saith the Lord. They are afraid to say, well, since that's what the Bible says, that's what we will abide by. Well, the Word of God says, first of all, that perhaps close friends, some said, yes, this is he, but most of the people said, well, he's like him. I want to tell you something. The Word of God says this man's friends and his neighbors could not even say, this is the man, and he's been miraculously healed. Can I tell you this? Did you know that when Jesus shows up, people are exposed? Are you listening to that? We're going to look at five groups of people. We've already discussed two of them. Did you know that we find the real true colors of these people in the midst of the miraculous intervention of God? And I want to tell you again, when Jesus shows up, people's true identity is revealed. The Bible said, here is a man that his friends are saying, well, uh, we don't know who he is. Uh, he looks like him. And another said, well, he, this is he, but now we don't have a clue how he can see. And then the Bible says, those that represented perhaps the church, the religious people said, well, tell us what happened. <laughs> and the Bible said that he begins to tell them what happened. And they said, well, what do you think about the man? And, and the young man said, well, I, I think he's a prophet. And they said, wait a minute, he can't be a prophet, he can't be of God because this is the Sabbath and nobody from God would heal on the Sabbath day. And the young man said, well, I, I'll just be honest with you. You know, y'all have said he can't be of God, but, uh, and he begins to quote scripture. He learned it from somewhere and he said, well, you know, how can anybody that's a sinner or wicked do something like this? And he said, why do you want to know about him? And the Pharisees well, said to him, Why, well, you were all together born in sin, and do you teach us? If I've ever seen anybody that is typical of what is going on in our world today, this is it right here. Listen to what they said. You were all together born in sin, but the indication is that we weren't. They didn't realize they were revealing their true colors. They didn't know that they were admitting, hey, we think we are what we are by our own strength and by our own ability. They said, you were born in sin. Yes, indeed he was. All of us are. That's why the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I get amazed at people in situations that they begin to give volumes of truth when they think they know what is going on. I've seen this in so many different places. You better be careful when you get around people who have the answers for everything. Someone said perhaps it's better to keep your mouth closed 
when people think yourself to be a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubts about whether you're a fool or not. Well, I want to say to you today, when you begin to tell everybody what your opinion is and what you think, you need to be careful. I've oftentimes said to people, my sweet wife is a precious gift to me from God. I don't know if you know it or not, but sometimes I'm known for much speaking. I was in a revival meeting up close to the Oklahoma border last year, and I was walking up the steps going into the church. It was a, or rather up a walkway, something like you have here at Cedar Heights. And as I was walking up that walkway, a man about five or six yards away, whom I'd never seen before in my life, said, I knew you were the preacher because I heard you before I saw you. Well, I got to be honest, a lot of people say that about me. And what my wife, sweet wife will do, if we're sitting around a table doing a lot of talking, I will just feel a little nudge on my foot or my leg. And what that is, Judy is saying, Honey, you've talked enough. Don't you think you should let somebody else talk? And Judy tells people, Not one time that I have done that has Johnny ever just hushed. She said he speaks up more because he always says, Oh, am I talking too much? Even when I'm rebuked about talking too much, I talk more. Well, I've been around people like these Pharisees. I've behaved like that myself at times. But the Bible says these Pharisees begin to talk to this young man and straighten him out about things in his life. They begin to talk like they know who Jesus is. And the young man says, well, I'm amazed at this. Because you don't know what he's saying is, you don't know what you're talking about. But the Word of God said, these Pharisees who represent religion could not rejoice in this young man's redemption. Their true colors were revealed when Jesus showed up, but to someone else. The Bible says that the Pharisees went to his parents and they said, well now, is this your son? And they said, well, yes, indeed, it's our son. Was he born blind? The question was asked to them. And they said, yes, he was born blind. And they said, by what means does your son see? And the Bible said they wouldn't give an answer because the Jews had already agreed that if anybody gave Jesus credit for anything that was done good, that they would remove them from being a part of the synagogue. In other words, we say nowadays, kick them out of the church. And so the Bible said that they said, we're not going to answer that question. He's of age, ask him. I can't, I can't fathom this. <clears throat> I can't imagine a parent who is so linked to religion that they can't rejoice that their blind son for the first time in his life has seen. I, I can't imagine religion grasping someone's heart but I'm reminded of something that happened to me years and years ago. I was preaching a revival meeting in a, a city in Alabama, <clears throat> and we went to eat with three sisters who I perceived to be members of the church where I was preaching. I'd been there several times, and so we went to their home for lunch one day. <clears throat> we were talking about the church family and everything, and they said, oh, Brother Johnny, we're not a member here. I said, what do you mean? Y'all go to church here all the time. And they said, well, we're not members here. I, we were, they were treating the visiting evangelists. They said, well, Brother Tucker, we're of, and they gave the denomination they were from. And they said, our daddy made us promise on his deathbed that we would never leave the certain denomination where he was a member. And she said, we made that commitment. And I thought to myself, what kind of parent makes a child be committed to a religion or a denomination rather than the Lamb of God. And so the Word of God says that this young man's mother and dad showed their true colors. They didn't even want to step out and be exposed for what they really felt because they were afraid of religion claiming them. And then the Bible said, not, not just the friends and the neighbors and the people that were standing around and the religion and his mother and dad. But the Bible says this man is absolutely alone. Can I ask you a question? What excuse do you give for not worshiping God? You say, well, Brother Johnny, I can't sing. I can't either. 
He said, Brother Johnny, uh, I, I'm not a good teacher. I don't consider myself a good teacher. He said, well, Brother Johnny, I don't, I, I don't look like they do. But what's that got to do with anything? He said, well, Brother Johnny, I'm not healthy. That has nothing to do with worshiping God. Here is a young man who has faced <clears throat> incredible difficulty. No one has rejoiced with him. I, I'm still overwhelmed. I'm not trying to be redundant. I'm just amazed and overwhelmed that a man who has never seen looks around him and he finds no one rejoicing, not a single soul, not even mother and dad. And so the Bible says the man finds himself away from everybody, away from other people. And then listen to this. The Bible says, and when he found him, can I tell you this? No matter what your problem is, no matter how great your struggles are, no matter how deep your difficulty is, no matter how much your loss is, no matter what you have faced, I want you to know God makes it his business to find you in his son. I'm blessed to tell you this. <clears throat> God wanted us to know who he was. And when we read the Old Testament, it, it speaks to us about God. And sometimes we have difficulty in knowing, well, who really is God? And God said, I want you to know what I feel. I want you to know my hurt, my pain, my love. I want you to know everything about me. And so God said, the best way for me to let you know who I am, the Word of God says he clothed himself in flesh and came as a babe and was born. And that's why Jesus Christ came, to reveal God to us. He who is God came, stepped out of heaven, and came to this earth to reveal himself to us. I want you to know today, this man in the ninth chapter of the book of John is not the only one to whom God makes it his business to get to in their dilemma. I've seen people all over the world who have been hurting incredible pain, struggles like you've never seen. I've told you once before here in this church, but in El Salvador, your pastor, Brother Charlie, has been with us to El Salvador and to the Philippines. But in El Salvador, in an area that is one of the most difficult I've ever been in in my life, I've never seen greater need in my life than I did there in that village. And we went there that day, and I walked into the door of what was called a house, but it had literally a mud floor, not a dirt floor, a mud, literally I'm speaking, a mud floor. The door would hardly, didn't cover the hole. And I walked in and there was a man that was sitting in a chair and had a little table and I sat down. I noticed Brother Ed that we were working with stood beside the table and so um, we talked to the man and he was 34 years of age and was dying. And uh, Brother Charlie, you had given me some money and you said, Brother Johnny, use this where it can be most effective. And I, after the young man invited Jesus into his heart, he was gloriously saved. I started to go out that makeshift door. And I turned around and I said, one of the team members that came with me gave me these uh, $5 bills. You remember, Brother Charlie, it was $25 bills. And I gave him that money and I said, God sent this to you to let you know that he cared. I don't know if I ever told you, Brother Charlie, that man died some months later. But that man came to know Jesus Christ and his wife and his three children after that. Well, I walked out the door and Brother Ed and I were walking back in the village to shake hands and to minister to people. And Brother Ed said, Brother Johnny, did you notice that uh, I didn't sit down? And I said, yes, I did. He said, the reason I didn't, Brother Johnny, did you look around in that little place? I said, no, Brother Ed. He said, Brother Johnny, in that house, a man and his wife and three children, there was that table where you sat and two chairs. There was that table and two chairs. No cooking harp, nothing. The, it was an empty mud pocket. But you know something? Jesus loved that man enough to send us thousands of miles across uh, the gulf to go to that man's home and to tell him that Jesus died for him and the man was gloriously saved. And the pastor of that church said, his wife and three children come to church faithfully now. Do you know why? Because Jesus found him just like he did this man. Now I want you to notice what happens. Here's the worship part. The Bible said Jesus says to the young man, 
do you believe in the Messiah or God or do you believe in salvation? That was the question he was asking me. He said, I, I don't know who he is that I can to believe. And Jesus said, well, you've spoken with him and I am the Messiah. And you know what the Bible said? The young man said, well, uh, let me think about it a while. <laughs> uh, can I tell you this? Quit trying to talk people into decisions. You can't do that. You might talk them into making a physical decision, but you can't talk people into coming to Jesus. You know what that man said? Jesus said, he's standing before you. I'm the Messiah. Would you believe? And he, you know what the Bible said he said? He said, I believe. And then you know what he did? He listened to what Jesus said. Jesus said, okay now, you've been saved. You've become a Christian. I want you to go to this a church or go to this denomination or go to this place and they're going to teach you how to worship. Is that what he said? No, no. Now listen to me. Don't, don't, don't you get offended what I'm about to say because I thank God for preparation in having a worship service but nobody can teach you to worship. Nobody can teach you to worship. Here was a young man who knew nothing about Jesus except he probably was a good man and he was a prophet. But the Word of God says the very moment, the very moment that the young man got saved, he finds himself worshiping Jesus. You know what causes you to worship him? That right there, just being saved. You say, well, Brother John, I'd like to know how to worship. Oh, if you ever get saved, you know how. Nobody has to train you or teach you. I'll be honest with you. I have been in some churches that they think it's their job to teach people how to worship. They manipulate people and coerce people. I've been in some services where the music was, uh, the crescendo, everything about the program, they were trying to get people into a frenzy so we can get to the place that we can worship. I've actually been in church before where the preacher would say, okay, if you want to worship God, you've got to raise your hands like this. And I've, I've been so many times, so many places that they think we'll train you how to worship. No, 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 you can't do that. You can't do that. The fact is, I'll tell you something, whatever you have to offer people and trying to train them to worship, it is superseded by redemption in a human's heart. And if you ever get saved, the first thing you'll do is worship. I look in the Bible where, I think it's in the book of Acts where Peter and John were going into the temple and there was a man that was lame and the word of God said, he said, oh, can you give me some alms? I'm hungry, I, I need something. Peter looked down and he said, well, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I'll give to you. And he reached out and said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the Bible said the man jumped up, and you know the next thing he did. He said, well, now, sir, would you tell me what I'm supposed to do? Would you teach me? I, I think I need to lo learn how to worship God. You, you know what the man did? The Bible says upon being healed, standing up for the first time in his life, the word of God said he walked right behind Peter and John into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. You don't have to be trained to praise God. The Bible said as soon as this man became a child of God, he worshiped Jesus. Did you know that's natural? It's normal. He said, well, Brother Johnny, when does worship begin? The moment you get saved. When do I learn how to worship God? The moment you get saved. Well, how do I know how to worship? Just get saved. Because I want to tell you something. The spring well of joy that he puts in your heart, he says this, peace that passes understanding, joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. If he ever comes into your heart and impregnates you with the reality of eternal life, Nobody will have to coerce you to worship him. It's a normal thing to do. And I find this man, maybe we're standing over to the side like the friends and the mother and the dad and the Pharisees. Maybe we're looking on. Maybe the disciples that the Bible doesn't say anything else about in this passage of Scripture. Maybe they're standing looking on and they see a man that immediately upon redemption, they see this man praising the one that they said can't be of God. That's amazing to me. They said he couldn't be of God because nobody would heal on the Sabbath day if he were of God. But the word of God said, they see the evidence of it right here. I remember reading in scripture again where the Bible said they looked at 
uh, these men of God, Peter and some others, and they said, you act like you're drunk. You, you, this is early morning. How in the world have you been drinking? And they tried to accuse them of drinking. That's why they were so happy. But the Bible says there's one thing about it. They looked at him and they said, there is no doubt you have been with Jesus. Did you know getting saved opens up the avenue of worship? Genuine biblical worship begins. Its origin is the redemptive grace of God. It is not taught. It happens to you when you get saved, worship is the natural outflow of the redemptive heart. Then I got another question I want to ask. How does it continue? How does it continue? Let me tell you something. You will find worshiping continues in your spirit as you walk with him. I like looking at the Bible. I've mentioned the Apostle Peter several times this morning, and I like looking at the Bible when the Word of God said Peter and the other disciples were in the boat, and they see Jesus walking, and they're scared to death, and they look and they say, well, that's a ghost. And then Jesus said, no, don't worry about it, y'all, it's me. And Peter said, well, Lord, if it's you, bid me come unto you. And the Bible said, Jesus said, come on. And the word says that Peter stepped out of that boat and began to walk on the water. And then he began to see the waves and the wind blowing. And, he, and he, rather than pay attention to Jesus, he began to look at the things around him. And the Bible said he began to sink. And all of a sudden he heard Mark or James back on the boat saying, Hey, you better swim harder. No, that's not what he heard. No, 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 no. He heard them back there cheering him on. No, 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 no. That's not what he heard. You see, this man who had trusted Jesus recognized immediately that while he was looking and trusting the Lord and perhaps worshiping him, I suspect walking on water to get to him, I suspect that's about as good a worship experience as one could find. And the Bible said, as he's walking across that water, he begins to sink beneath the tide, and the Word of God said the very natural thing for a child of God to do. He looked up and said, Lord, would you give me another discourse about worship? Lord, could you instruct me, please, what verse, what chapter, what book do I need to look into to be able to worship you? Oh, no, 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 no. The natural inclination of his heart was redemption. He who knew what it was to be redeemed looked up and the Bible said, Peter just looked up at Jesus and said, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. You know how you continue worshiping? By keeping your focus on Jesus. That's what the devil wants to do, get our eyes off of the Lord. He wants to get us uh, involved. In, I, I, I know we should be careful about the virus, but most of the decisions that have been made are not because of a virus. They've been made because of a fear of a virus. Most of everything you've seen around this world has not been decided because of the virus. It has been decided because of the fear of the virus. And the devil has had us in his clutches because multitudes of things have caused more death than the virus. Listen, church of the living God, don't you miss that? We are born millions of babies and nobody, nobody closes down church services because we are protesting because of the abortion of babies. And yet our doors close as soon as the virus frightened us. I'm not saying it's not wise. Brother Chad said we've tried to be wise. But here's the problem. I'm afraid sometimes we respond to the fear rather than the virus itself. So you know what happened to this man, Peter? When he started going beneath, he simply looked up to Jesus. You know how you continue to worship? By putting other things aside, get your focus back on him. Not on money, <clears throat> and not on everything we do. But it, and I heard a preacher preach this morning. I've heard several, so don't try to figure out who it was. But I heard a preacher preach this morning, and he said he had really been struggling because of this and that and seeing people. And he even mentioned people who had died because of the virus. And then he said, I'm really concerned about people who've lost their jobs. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> Sounded to me like he really revealed what he'd been thinking about. I said, oh, I don't think he meant to say that. I don't think he really meant to say that. I'm more concerned about seeing people lose their jobs than those that have died. I don't think he meant that, but that came out of his mouth. That was just this morning. You see, you know how you continue to worship God? Not because you're coerced by men. Not because you're worked into a frenzy. 
It's because you stay with him. You keep trusting, keep walking with him. You know why the songs that we've been singing this morning blessed you so much? You know why the music thrilled us so much? It's because it was about the Redeemer. The Redeemer. I promise you, when your praise team starts sitting down, they don't think about, well, now, what will make them feel good? They think if they're genuine praise leaders and you have them, <clears throat> I believe they begin to say, now, how can we get this message across to the people that their hope is in Jesus, their peace is in Jesus, their praise is in him? So we find the origin of worship is just being saved. You say, Brother Johnny, I'm not qualified. This man was not qualified at all. Not at all. And yet the word of God says, this eternal book said, this man worshiped. Now I want to tell you something. If the Bible says he worshiped, I want you to know he worshiped. You can't explain that away. So the origin of worship is just giving your heart to Christ. Secondly, how do you continue this worship? Just by staying with him, trusting him, walking with him. When you fall down, admit it. I was talking to someone just this past week and uh, I don't know what the conversation was about, but it was about uh, us being honest. And I said, when you mess up, just admit it. Have you ever been around people that can't say, I, I, I'm, I am wrong? Have you ever been around people that can't say, I did it, I'm the guilty party? Now, ma'am, I'm not talking about your husband. I'm, I'm talking about, you know, just hypothetical situation. Have you ever been around people that just can't say, I am wrong? Well, the Bible says the way that you continue in worship is to just be honest with God. Be open with him. When you have questions, ask him. I like it when the Bible said that Jesus uh, came up on a situation one day and the disciples were there. And Jesus said, what's going on? And they said, oh, oh, uh, uh, Jesus, he said, I, I brought your, my son to your disciples and because my son throws himself in the water and throws himself in the fire and the demons are going to kill my son and, and uh, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't help him. And Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. And Jesus said, said to the man, you know, if you'll believe, you can have what you need. And he said, do you believe? And listen to the honesty of this dad. He said, Lord, I believe, but help thou mine unbelief. We know that you have trouble with doubt and despair. Be honest about it. You don't continue worshiping by living a hypocritical life and make it like you got everything in, under control. I see people oftentimes where we've been that, they run up to me and tell me how many times they've read the Bible through in a year. Ah, uh, if that's on your mind, it didn't do you a bit of good. If the thing you want to say to people and if you want something to emanate from your life to let every people know how many times you read the Bible through this year, it didn't help you. But the Bible says the way you continue in worship is to just stay with Him. Trust Him. When you mess up, admit it. When you fail, tell Him. When you have doubts, like that daddy did, just say, Lord, I, I trust you, but I've got some doubts about these situations. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And Jesus said to him, you're going to get what you want because you've been honest about it. But then the last thing I want to talk to you about is this. How long does worship last? How long does it last? <clears throat> have you looked in your Bible at the people who were stepping across the river into death. Have you observed their lives? I like it when Paul says this, to live is Christ and to die is a morbid thing. Is that what he said? <laughs> no, no, no. And Paul meant it. He said to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Does that sound uh, bad? To die is gain. I've had the responsibility of being around two families who had death this week and uh, one was a 47 uh, year old young man the other was a 77 year old woman and 77 is not old certainly not to someone who's 73 and the blessed hope that we have is in knowing that we don't weep as those who have no hope and I said to Rudy while I stood by his side I said Rudy we, we're not going to forget about you we'll be here but I said, as, as we were weeping and, and they were struggling with the weeping because they had buried their son who was 50 years of age last year. And I said, Rudy, weeping is good. It's healthy for you. Don't, don't worry about the weeping. Let it fly. But I said, Rudy, remember, God says we, we don't weep as those who have no hope. Because I said, one day, 
Carol Fay, we'll see her again. And I said, can you imagine what happened when Carol Fay stepped through the portals of glory and your son Darwin was standing there saying, Mom, good to have you home. You know how your worship ends? It never does. You know what we're going to do when we get to heaven? We'll worship him for the eons of time. You see, worship is not coerced. Worship begins, its origin is when true biblical worship. The Bible says it begins when redemption takes place. Secondly, how does it continue? Just by sticking with him. Um, my wife said to me one day, uh, we get up every morning and do our Bible study, and she sits to my left, and I sit uh, to her right, and we drink our coffee. Don't mess with us till we've had plenty of coffee. And um, I was sitting there one morning, and I don't think I had my phone in my hand, Brother Charlie. I might have, but I don't think so. But Judy just leaned over and looked at me, and she simply asked this question. She said, Honey, have you been studying as much as you should? You know what my answer was? It took me 30 minutes to answer her. Brother Chad, when you ask a question with a yes, no answer, it's kind of easy to come up with an answer, isn't it? But it took me 30 minutes to answer that question. Can I tell you this? When you ask a yes or no answered question and it takes you 30 minutes to come up with the answer, it's going to be the wrong one, Brother Terry. And I told Judy, I said, well, baby, I... Uh, I pay attention to people. I study people and, and I watch people and I evaluate response and all. And then 30 minutes later, I came up with the answer after preaching a 30-minute message that wasn't worth a nickel. I said to her, no, no. You know how you continue in worship? By sticking close to him. By staying with him, trusting him. When you fall, help letting him get you up. And then how long does worship last? Never ends. It never ends. I want to ask you to do this. Take your Bible out sometime this afternoon and maybe the rest of this week and evaluate the lives of people who stepped out into eternity and look at what happened to them before they died. Let me tell you a sad story. Moses, most theologians believe that he is the best type that represents Jesus in the Old Testament. And one day God said to Moses, strike the rock when they were out in the wilderness. And he did, and water came out in abundance. And then another time God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to speak to the rock. But because Moses had his focus on people rather than Jesus, we know that he did because he said in anger, must we fetch you water out of this rock, you rebels? And the Bible said that he spoke or rather struck the rock again. And the Bible says it appears there was more abundant water that comes out this time because the first time the Bible didn't say they had water for the animals. They may have, but the Bible doesn't say that. But on this occasion the Bible said when he struck it the second time they got water for the people to drink and the animals I've been to Mount Nebo I've looked down at Jericho I've seen that before when I've been in the <coughs> holy lands can you imagine what Moses felt when he went up to that mountain and God said Moses this is where I was going to lead you and this is where I was going to let you lead your people but because you disregarded me you can't go and you can't lead them. And did you know the Bible says his physical strength was not abated, nor was his eye dim, but Moses lay down and died. Do you know why? You know why Moses' joy, or maybe Moses' worship, was not present right there? Because Moses had disregarded walking with God day by day, being sensitive to him. Don't let that happen to you. Uh, I'll never be the caliber person Moses was. I love it when God said to Moses, I, I'm through with these people. I'm going to wipe them out. Do away with them and I'll make a great nation out of you. And Moses said, Lord, if you must blot out their names, blot mine out. What a giant for God. And yet we see him up on that mountain having not, having the privilege to go do what it appears his life was meant to do, and that is lead the people of God into victory. 
Do you know why your worship must continue and never end? Because God will use you if you continue to worship Him. It's not a trained, fixed disposition. It is a natural occurrence. When you're saved by grace, it begins. As you stay with Him, it continues. And it will never end as you walk with Him. And then this. I'm reading an eternal book. Look at this. Talking about Moses, the man of faith. Moses is in heaven right now worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Even though he went through incredible struggles because he disregarded God at a point in his life. I want to say to you today, listen to this. If you want your worship to continue, stay close to Jesus. If you don't want it to end, stay sold out to him. Trust him with all your heart. Do what he tells you to do. I want to say to Cedar Heights Baptist and to others who are listening, worshiping God is available to all of us. Fact is, it's a necessity. And it is yours because of one thing. It is yours because you've been saved by grace. Now practice it. Practice it. Worship Him. When times are tough, when times are bad, continue in your worship. And then I want you to know your worship will never cease as you abide in Him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for giving us the true biblical perspective on worship. A man who momentarily had been redeemed. A man who just now has come face to face with you and was saved by grace and without any training, without any knowledge of what to do, he found himself worshiping you. And God, for people who've let the fear of this virus rob them of that worship, help them to know if they're saved by grace that they have reason to worship. And then, Lord, for those who've never been saved, who don't understand what we're talking about when we say worship you. They maybe even didn't understand the songs we were singing about Jesus today. Help them to know if they would bow their heads and repent of their sin and invite Jesus into their heart that could know what genuine, true worship is today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. One of the things that first impressed me about Brother Johnny Tucker and Chad mentioned uh, a love offering Whenever Miss Lynn, our treasurer, writes the check, the love offering check, she doesn't write it to Johnny Tucker. She writes the, the check to his church, where he's a member there in Central Alabama. She doesn't write it to him. And then the church distributes that money to the International Missions Association that Brother Johnny's the head of. So I can, I can guarantee you that the money that you send is dealt with appropriately and I've got to sp I got to spend a month with brother Johnny and the team in the Philippines and as he said we've been in Guatemala with him we have teams that go to El Salvador also and minister there I don't know how many nations he's been to I know he's been to India uh, but whenever you give you're given to a missions organization not just to a man and as you were preaching, Brother Johnny, I, I kept hearing talking about knowing him, worshiping him. I kept hearing in the back of my mind when I was a teenager, I heard a preacher preach, and he, he stood up and he just said several times, he said, do you know him? Do you know him? Not do you know things about him. Do you know him? Do you know him? Thank you for joining with us today. God bless you as you go on your way. And as you go, make sure that you know him. In Jesus' name, God bless. Thank you.